Welcome to Saltgrass, a show about how local communities can engage with the climate crisis at a grassroots level. My name is Ali Hanley. Today's episode is part two about an event that ran last year called Jackich La. I highly recommend that you listen to part one before you listen to this one, because I'm just sort of going to continue on and all of the information from part one will make this episode make sense. So if you're listening on your podcast app, you know what to do. If you're listening on Main FM or 3MDR and don't have a podcast app that you use, you can go to saltgrasspodcast.com and listen to episode one from the website. In summary, though, in the last episode, we heard some audio I captured when I attended the event and also a conversation I had with the creators a couple of weeks after the event uh, where we talked about the creative process and all of the things that went into it. So we heard about how and why Bendigo became a designated region of gastronomy by UNESCO. We also heard about the creative practices of Jody and the team at Carbon Arts and how their quest to use creative means of connecting people to the societal shifts that need to happen in the climate crisis has, through various projects, led up to this event, Jakichla. We heard how Rebecca Phillips was able to share some wisdom from the Jaja Rung about how to eat country healthy and how the ancient European folk story of stone soup was a perfect vehicle to help bring all of these threads together. Today we're going to continue on our exploration of this event. We have more from the creators and also more audio from the event, including some on-the-spot Vox Pop type interviews I did with the guests and so we'll hear their responses after a very full afternoon of thought, discussion and food. The creative team involved and the people that you'll hear from in our interviews today are Jodie Newcomb, who's the executive producer and director, Sam Thomas, was creative development sound design stage manager of The Animate Objects, Will Tate was co-producer, performer and MC. Rebecca Phillips was creative development performer and advisor on Jara Knowledge. Charlie Owens was creative development and stage manager of Inanimate Objects. And Anna Knight is from the city of Bendigo and was working at council at the time. And she was instrumental in Bendigo receiving the UNESCO designation of Creative City of Gastronomy. The soundscape you can hear in the background behind me now was created for the event by Mitch Boney and other creative collaborators were Alex Perry from Situate Dining and Ira Barker from Murnong Mummers. As ever, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that all parts of this episode, including the event of Jakichla, was recorded on Jara country, the unceded lands of the Jaja Rung, who have been the custodians and caretakers of this land for tens of thousands of years. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Salt, 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 yeah. Salt, 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 Salt of the earth people. Grassroots change. Salt grass. Listen to all episodes of Salt Grass on your podcast app or at saltgrasspodcast.com. So at the end of the last episode, we heard the beginning of the performance, which is Rebecca sharing the creation story of the Jaja Rung. We were all gathered outside around a simple stage, a circle of sand. She was drawing in it with a stick as she told the story of the waterways being created and putting shells and balls where the emu nests were. And she was doing this beautiful arm movements to signify which bird was being told in the story at certain times. And so she embodied the story she was telling. And then to have Will come in as the white settlers and his attitude was so familiar as well of, you know, don't be silly, don't imagine things that aren't there, your spirits aren't real. He carved lines in the sand through her lines. He carved lines to indicate fences and indicate changing waterways and changing the landscape to suit his purposes which is exactly what we've done as settlers and colonists and invaders here without paying any respect initially to the Indigenous wisdom of how this land runs. And I think, for me, it became really visceral as I saw it acted out and saw them actually carving the sand with their different stories. So I found that really powerful. So... 
the Europeans have arrived in Jara country. They have come in the wrong way. We have realized that they're here to stay. The old people had considered making kinship systems with these people so that we knew how we would interrelate, how we would hand over the laws of Bunjil so the newcomers may take care of country as we were. But how will we share the land? Land. Lovely, lush land. Lucky me. Right, well, we can start by getting some sheep in here. And we're going to need fences, 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 fences to keep the sheep safe. We're going to need fences to say whose land is whose. We're going to need fences to keep those beasties at bay. And fences to keep out the pesky natives. Oh, what next? Water. Water, that water looks great. All right, going to have to dig a channel though. Here we go. <gasps> Stop! No, 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 don't touch that water. Why not? That's sacred water. It's poppycock. Sacred being lived there. Water hold memory and song. You need to get that primitive superstitious nonsense out of your head. It's time to evolve or get left behind. Ugh. No! If you disturb this water, you will make trouble for all the land. Trouble, is it? You want trouble? What? There's going to be trouble if you don't shut up and get out of my way. Does this man have a murab? Is he not connected? Can he not feel country? Can he not see that we hold the story, the ceremony, that we belong to this land? He got big eye, just want to take, take, take. No wook jara with the land. I can see we're going to do this the hard way for you and for me. Maybe one day you'll see. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> Holy hallelujah, it's gold. Oh, gold. There's more gold. There's gold everywhere. This country was made to make me rich. I better line my pockets before anyone else gets here. <laughs> Uh, we're going to need more fences. Oh, lots of bloody trees in the way, though. Look on the bright side. Fuel and timber, as far as the eye can see. The performance then went on, and at a certain point, Will and Rebecca started talking to each other as themselves, and they had entered the present moment. And between them, they spoke, and attempted an understanding, trying to find a way forward from this point that we're all at now, a way forward together. It turns out that disrupting the health of a particular watering hole can indeed cause trouble throughout the ecology of entire region. Our economy is slowly but steadily shifting in order to survive as the imbalances generated by blind exploitation of the land start to bite. Our religion has long since relinquished its moral hold over the general population, leaving us to trust as best we can in a sense of humanity. And as we hurtle through a universe that seems bleak and powered by senseless forces, but there are pockets of us in that void who are warming to the idea that things other than humans might be intelligent, other animals, plants, the land itself, that intelligence might in fact reside in some form in all things, even a stone. Through the performance, we were offered little samples of food that reflected the story, 
Unfortunately, Alex Perry wasn't able to join us when I interviewed the creative team, but he was a creative genius in the kitchen that day, and with each sample that we got, he spoke a little about how it was made and what was in it. So the performance was in three parts, from the creation story to the story of colonisation to the current moment of trying to work together and find a better way to live on country. When I sat down with the creators a few weeks later, we discussed this structure. Yeah, so in the creative process, we were trying to figure out what we would put on a plate. I wanted to look at country as a reflection of that plate, what was there and what wasn't there. And there was a lot that wasn't there that is important cultural foods to to Jara people and as part of our, our diet, our connection to country, expressing our culture that just simply wasn't accessible. And so how could we show this in a way that was really clear and not so direct, but visually clear? So that's how we came up with the three plates idea. The first one, what we would like it to have been and what it would have been like before all the changes to country. Uh, and the second one will is a proper reflection of country now, of what, what things we see there. And sometimes when we look around at what's abundant, it, it's not even a re- reflection of Jara country. You wouldn't be able to tell that this is Australia or specifically Jara country. And the last plate was more about what we can do together. So it was looking at the old ways, looking at the changed ways, and then the last plate was, yeah, what's this stone soup we can cook up together? Because everyone has something valuable to bring and we really wanted everyone to, to come in and, and have ownership over this new way forward that we can all care for country. Thanks, Beck. That was how the Edible Welcome to Country was structured and we called it the three acts, but actually the three plates is, is probably a better way of describing the way that that story evolved from what was, what it became and what could be. So... Each of the bites that we had were a reflection of what would would have been on that welcome to country plate with that notion of, in a way, an indigenous gastronomy being how you eat for the health of country. So how do you eat your country healthy is you eat what's abundant, but you also eat what needs to be culled or what needs to be harvested at any time. And and there's much more complex than that, obviously. But the simple way that we can understand that today is looking at the rabbit infestation and we we actually had lots of conversations in our development meetings with Alex and even with the Monong Mamas and understanding how the bureaucratic tangle of abattoirs and health regulations mean that we can't even eat the rabbit that's in the fields that's destroying the native flora and fauna and that is endlessly frustrating but is a call to action and a great opportunity for creativity. Like how do, how do we create a mobile abattoir that is not an arts project? I mean, heck, why not? And so there's that provocation in that plate was both what we should be eating and then, well, why aren't we? And I think Alex Perry, it's a shame he couldn't be here today because he has done a lot of research on this and in his new restaurant that will be at the Midland Hotel, he's almost calling it the reverse of the fine dining. It's like, you know, go out and catch it and we might serve it to you. you know? But he will be serving rabbit, I think. And it's an interesting cultural opportunity for our region and probably across the entire country. How do we make rabbit popular again? Because there's so many stories we all share from our parents and grandparents about how rabbit and other animals that were abundant featured on the plate and we didn't have so many bureaucratic hurdles so I I think that structure is a great way of explaining to people who weren't there how we were thinking both at that sort of policy level and the cultural level about the history of food and and what an indigenous gastronomy might mean. The other part about the the food component in the project and how stone soup actually was realised with the participants is that we invited everybody to bring something, bring food to the event that was foraged, grown or that they produce. And then Alex Perry and his team picked and choosed and put it all together for the final serving of food at the end of the event as well. So that that was how it manifested. Our stone soup was presented and there was great enthusiasm from people that brought all sorts of wide-ranging ingredients for us to play with. And so it was just a nice way for our participants to also feel really included. And it actually came about because we were going, how are we going to make a food event and feed people when we don't have a budget <laughs> for food. So that that was, you know, that that's where the restraints become the opportunity. But also as a creative event, 
in a gastronomy setting, that's the ultimate creative act for a chef, isn't it? To just be given a bunch of stuff you don't know what's coming and you've got to produce something out of it for 100 people. It's actually a TV show, Ready, Steady, Cook. (laughs) (laughs) It was so lovely too. It was delicious. It was delicious. (laughs) Yeah. After the performance, the audience were invited to enter several levels of conversation with each other to reflect on how we, as guests and as people in our community, can help to heal country, be it through growing food or eating food or storytelling or whatever our contribution might be. We took notes and then there was more food and time to just talk to the others who were there. We were also invited to take a stone from a collection of stones provided to us and tell the stone our intentions, the ways we want to do better for country. And then at the end of the day, all of those stones were placed in a dry creek bed and gifted to country. So that was a really beautiful blessing for me personally and for all of us as a team. And even though the rain's coming down the following day to help with the, the stone we'd placed in the creek there on that spot that held the intentions of all of the discussions people had had that day. Uh, I'm hoping there was that understanding of Bukjara, what, what can I give back to country or what can I change in my business to be a little bit more sustainable or do something that will benefit country uh, and putting that intention in the stone. This was the, the real beautiful thing of it, the, all the stories tying together into that stone suit. And, you know, just having one small contribution, making a a larger feast for country, with country, and those intentions going off with country. So what you're saying is we kind of made stone soup for the country to nourish the country with our intentions. Is that right? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely how it evolved. We were planning it where a creek was filled with water but didn't turn out that way but the the rains came in and answered that call to to carry off those intentions the next day so yeah another beautiful thing and now we're in a different season now it's still cold and it's still wet but I think we were really blessed on on that day to have some blue skies and the weather to not be uncomfortably cold for an outdoor event and this is really country working with us for sharing such a important story and message that is probably overdue. But it, it did feel that it came about in the right time with the right people in the right place. During the edible Welcome to Country, it was really, really nice to have some of those signs of country talking to us there, sharing the, the story of Bunjil's laws and not taking too much from country and only taking what you need and being aware of your place in the whole ecosystem and that other things will need certain things and we're not to take take away from their needs as well. Having Wedgetail Eagle fly over over the top of this storytelling was really important and culturally significant in reaffirming that this was the, the right step, the right story and the right place for that to happen. At the very end, as everyone was relaxing and talking and debriefing about the event, I caught some of the guests to see what they thought of the day and what it made them think about in terms of their own lives and work. And this is just some of the responses. My name is Lana. You told me that you are wanting to start a little farm that involves regenerative agriculture and permaculture and all these sorts of ideas. How much of what was said today was new to you or surprised you or made you excited and how much had you been thinking about or along similar lines already? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it made me excited. Um, I think when we got our land, uh, it makes me very uncomfortable to be an owner of land considering it's not our land to begin with. So the idea of whatever the percentage was, like 93% of it being privately owned and stuff and uh, Beck not having access to land, that made me really upset. Like... There's a native nursery in Harcourt that's getting started up and, and we were talking to Arnie Julie about the potential of her using our land because we have Barker's Creek running through the bottom and like to have access to that because like we really want to share our land with our community and so yeah the idea of like you know Murnong and like replanting of, of like natives back into the, the land and like endemic species not just necessarily natives as well to kind of bring Harcourt back. Those were the ideas kind of swirling in my head today. Do you see yourself becoming part of this gastronomy region in in what way? 
Um, I definitely like to. Like, I really like that, you know, it's the sister region to Emilia Reggiano. And, like, I really like how in Italy, how all the regions there kind of work together. Like, one specialises in Parmesan and one specialises in uh, ham. And they kind of, like, work together to do the slow food trail and stuff. And so I really like that we could do that but our point of difference could be using indigenous and and like the multicultural cultures that we have here my name's jason mccainch i work for macedon rangers shire as their private land conservation officer so i work with farmers and landholders to increase their biodiversity primarily through grazing animals which increases soil health increases water retention, all of those parts of regenerative agriculture that we, we're trying to manage better. What have you thought of today's event? What has that made you think? It's made me think about how the system still works as a whole. So, we, you know, regenerative ag is about the whole. So it's just refocusing, you know, a bit more about how we can connect the whole system and it's made me think about time as well. So I hear a lot of communication about deep time and the length of time, and um, that's made me think about time a lot better. And what did you think of the event as a whole, as a, an experience? I found the experience spectacular in the sense of just sitting and listening and taking time to listen. The smoking ceremony and all of those associated parts was healing for me in a sense of me just taking time to absorb what was being said and listen and not be worried about my, the rest of my busy life. Mark Wilfred Anstey, Lot 19. Today was brilliant. Like, what a generous exchange of storytelling and plan making. I loved that it was results driven. You know, it, it was um, outcomes driven, which a lot of the uh, time you just feel like you're sitting around talking to people who agree with you. But this seems to have results. The stuff was written down. It's like, uh, when I first started thinking, I thought this stuff, and it hasn't changed. It's still the same. But it just seems to be becoming more and more important about how to live well, you know, making all these choices about how to live well. Not for all the wrong reasons, like more money or more whatever, but making, making decisions about kids and water and food and, you know, it's got nothing to do with the things that we actually make value judgments on, you know? Like, I noticed a while ago that housing, because I build stuff, housing is all about making money. It's not about making houses. And, like, it's just such a terrible misunderstanding. And if we start remembering that housing is for housing people and shouldn't be for making profit and that food is for feeding people and keeping people happy and safe and healthy, you know. I always go back to the really primary motive behind every action. Or, you know, of course I don't, but I try. That's what I really try to do when I think about how I'm going to spend the next year or whatever and this you know this was unexpected I didn't just turn up because of the food don't look at me like that <laughs> which was great wasn't it but um you know I was going to shoot through after an hour and it was just excellent to hang around for five and talk it up yeah really excellent what did you think of the food uh oh it was great I mean Alex is a genius the food is spot on I've eaten all the weeds and all of that before I don't make a regular habit of it but actually rocket and greens are like a weed in in our garden and we eat that all the time. So my name's Mel of Gung Ho Growers and I came here I guess because we're a part of the region of gastronomy and we're producers so I was reflecting on it I'm really tired after four hours of talking I'm actually exhausted <laughs> And that was really weird because I love talking. <laughs> but I was, I was actually reflecting on the fact that the work that we do, when you're working all the time, you don't have the space and the time to actually talk and think about all the ideas that are fuzzing around in your brain or the inspirations necessarily that you have. Because if you, if you think about something, you either have to do it or you don't do it. So 
having the luxury and the ability and the space, I guess, and the facilitated time to be able to think and then get into the rhythm of talking. I was quite intimidated at first, but then after the couple of hours, I got into it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a really different experience for me. And I f it was a very different experience to come into a creative and quite heady space, if that makes sense. What do you think you'll take away? <laughs> Sorry, I've got her. You can have her in just one minute. <laughs> what do you feel like you might take away from this? I think what I can take away from it is the remembrance that it is really energising to talk about ideas. You know, that can give, it can give me the shits too because if you talk about stuff and never do anything, I, I don't want to be a part of that. But I think it's really important to um, talk with people who are not in your everyday world and your everyday circle about ideas and what you could do because that's actually how new things happen. It was fantastic. Just really great conversations and lots of interesting ideas and interesting people to talk to. I think, though, one substantial impression is of, I don't know, cultural elitism is a, what is a concern of mine. And even the word gastronomy is sort of elitist, right? And there's so many people in our community that would never use that word, would never come to something that had that word in it. And I think, don't know what it means. And, and I think that's really, that's important, that, that it goes beyond the sort of foodie elite. And we are at a vineyard in <laughs> Harcourt and with a beautiful event and, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it, just fantastic event and the beginning in particular, like Beck's introduction, just, and welcome to country, really amazing. Um, so I'm Joel Meadows. I run a business called the Green Hand Institute, uh, which is a permaculture education consulting business. And I, I teach on a lot of permaculture courses in this region. The standout for me absolutely was a phrase that Beck used today, which was eating the land healthy. And I feel like, oh man, we've got to get that right. Because so often I think we think that the health of the land is tied up with us locking it up or not touching it or protecting it. And it's actually, no, if we eat it and we need it, then we need it to be there again. You know, So we need the land to be rejuvenating because it's our food. Whereas actually if we see land as separate to us, that's about the worst thing I think we can do. So um, I was excited to hear that and excited to hear that. Of course, it's an indigenous perspective that you don't, that you don't lock the land up, you, you eat it. Um, but, that, but that actually can be something that heals the land and, and yeah, eating the land healthy. Really cool. <laughs> yeah. And the conversations have been good, as is often the case with things like this. It's like ideas, 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 and you just feel a little bit overwhelmed and you're not quite sure where it's going to go. I sat on a table looking at Indigenous and bush foods things to, to do with trying to, you know, get more of it happening, trying to think about how we honour the local Indigenous groups, but also spread the word too, because I think... Um, we're in a, a tricky situation with that stuff where we need, we actually need it, but it's treated as if it's a bit of a side issue and I think it's fundamental. And I'm also, one thing that didn't come up today but I reckon needs to be discussed in relation to food is scale. I think big is probably our worst enemy and not that small is always good, you know, because I suppose from my, from my permaculture perspective, I'm working with people all the time who are growing food in their backyards and I think that's fundamental. It would be very easy for a project like that to miss something like this and just work with farms and restaurants and, and whatever. And I think, and that stuff's really important too, but I think the, the backyard scale is kind of where it starts. And, and when people grow food in their backyard, they're far more likely to buy their food from a farmer's market than they are from a supermarket. And they're more likely to want to know where their food comes from. And when they, when they grow food in their backyard, they also know when they go to a shop that, oh, that's out of season because there's no way I could be growing that at this time of year. And that gives them a knowledge, a local knowledge, which is worth so much when they, they become much more conscious consumers as well as not being consumers, actually being pr genuine producers. So I think that's exciting and I'll be interested to see. It'd be very easy for a project like this to miss that and kind of skirt over the top of it. So I hope that, I hope that gets some, some air time.
My name is Laisel. I have loved the event. It's been the most beautiful collection of people sharing, sharing ideas and stories and, and just such a beautiful approach to connecting. I, I think the organisers set the scene really, really well. Started the whole conversation in a really intelligent, respectful way. What do you think you're going to take away from this event? Hopefully more connections. I'm really interested to meet more people who are working in this space. There are so many good people doing so many good things. Tell us what you do. I mill flour, a small batch, freshly milled, whole grain flour, milled on stone. I buy grains directly from farmers who are doing good things. I feel pretty blessed to do it. Goodness flour. There was a fair bit of talk around the table about, oh, you couldn't do that because entrepreneurs are always competing. And I, I really think that grains demonstrates that entrepreneurs can collaborate and do it well. Um, it just takes, it takes the intention to do it that way. So several weeks after the event, I caught up with the creators, as you know, and I asked them in retrospect how they feel about the event and, and what they think it achieved. So in your role at the City of Bendigo, having commissioned this piece, what, what were your feelings at the end of that event? Well, I was just completely blown away by the event to begin with um, it was just so beautiful and I just felt so privileged to be part of it and so humble to have had the opportunity to work with the, this amazing team who just did so much more than they were paid for or put in so much more time and I think it really did something that I hoped it would do which was of course it was about bringing people together but I think part of the hope that I had for the event would was that it would would begin to shift people's perspectives and and slowly start to shift the culture of the place where we live away from the unsustainable and kind of mindless use of the land and our resources to thinking more deeply about where things come from and where we live. And I think the stories that Beck shared and just the whole coming together across all those different sectors, I think it helped people to maybe put aside their own little part and think about something bigger, which I think is a great first step in everyone feeling more connected to the, the designation and seeing that it, it's more than just a council initiative to get tourists to our region or something like that. They can see that it's, it's something much deeper and much more interesting and then something that they can be a part of. So I think it really did that. I think a lot of people were really surprised and moved and enlightened and it helped people to find the common ground and as creatives, what was your reflection? Do you think it did what you wanted it to do, that event? Big question. <laughs> Who wants to answer first? For me, you know, the idea, having had this metaphor of stone soup and bring it forward, is that we were a stone bringing forth a soup. But we also kind of presented the idea that the city of gastronomy designation was also that kind of stone. It wasn't nourishing. It didn't come with funding but it came with an invitation that would attract people bringing together their disparate resources. And my hope is that now that stone has grown bigger because there's 100 people that have had that experience. So my hope is that we can find a way to keep that community active and, and keep its momentum going. While I've got the talking stick, I guess personally one thing I'd love to see is that in our creative process, we came up with this idea initially of literally serving people with a plate and having on that plate the traditional food items that you would have received when country was at its most abundant. But what would actually be on the plate would just be two or three little tiny morsels and then kind of big empty places with labels for the things that are no longer on that land. And as we played with that metaphor of the plate, we kind of also realised that it represented the only 3% of Jarrah country that traditional owners have easy access to. So I, I guess one of the things that excites me is the possibility that, that we could open up a culture of potentially landowners realising that they can be of service to country by allowing traditional owners onto their land to do cultural work. I have no idea what it would take to do that, but you know, if, if I can, as part of Carbon Arts and, and the collaboration with the, the City of Gastronomy designation do one thing moving forward, it would be that, yeah. Yeah, I think as an artist, I always feel very inspired and motivated by these projects, ideas, concepts, and, and that's what drives me to express those to people. I think what's really unique about this particular event 
is that it feels like not only just sharing those ideas, but feeling them being seeded in the community and having the community now take the baton and actually activate further growth and change in in whatever projects it inspires them to do rather than it just being a sort of more passive receptive audience so that that's really exciting for me to have now handed it over and say okay now people go you know make of it what you will or work together and and find new pathways with these ideas I think the event was a a lot of fun to deliver and wonderful to see everyone really enjoying themselves and being captured by the different elements. For the project itself and I suppose Carbon Arts as a project of how can arts play a role and how does the creative sector play a role in sustainable development, creating a culture of stewardship and, you know, Indigenous people the world around that is their culture. It is a culture of environmental stewardship. The evolution of this work feels like it's moving in the right direction and it's really gratifying to see culture be so strong and central in that journey. What is the 500-year plan for Jara Country? You know, Sam and I have been talking for a long time about seasonal events connect us to the harvest and, and changing weather and, and migration of animals etc but recognizing that that does change with climate change so that's a really powerful way to connect us to a changing climate and lots and lots of other little seeds that would just be so much fun to continue to be part of because because I live here and this is this is also the country that will carry me through to the earth so yeah <laughs> yeah I, I found the timing of the event quite significant because as we were packing up, the news came through that there were more COVID cases coming and then lockdown coming. So the fact that we were able to gather as 100 people in a physical space, have these discussions freely and be open to these signs that we got from the Wedgetail legal flying over as Beck's telling the story. And also it's significant that this particular part of the world is so damaged, so traumatised and that all of our energy and focus and emphasis is on healing that trauma and so that I think that that's really what resonated with me and with us is that we need all focus on healing right now and getting as strong and healthy as we possibly can both internally and externally you know and doing the inner work and the, and and then the work out there so that just the sense of a hundred people gathered around there was one point when Will brought everyone round. We had the beautiful performance, the the tone was set and then broke out into these smaller groups and then at one point Will brought everyone round and it almost felt like an old village square kind of format where there was a hundred people, you can hear one person speak in a hundred people and it really made me think about those central systems we're getting these news and these instructions from far away from places like Canberra or or wherever to be told you know masks on masks off kind of thing in small country towns where there's a lot of fresh air around and you see people walking their dogs in in wide open spaces with a mask on and you know like please I think that the fact that we were able to form a real live shared experience together as people in one place is profound in itself in during these times. Yeah, so true. I think the event went so smoothly. Yeah, big credit to the team in the background. Will and I were doing a big edible welcome to country that was you know, very theatrical in in a sense. All of the other things that were going on in the background, I was really impressed with my team and how how hard they were working and all those little things made Will and I look good. So, yeah, I was just really impressed with how smoothly everything went and how everyone was really open to the discussions. I didn't see one person not engaged with something they really wanted to talk about in their small groups and being able to capture that information using the environment so well with the wine barrels. I think it really gave people a chance to to bring out ideas they probably didn't know that they had sitting in the background and we really created that safe space for those bigger discussions on how we want our community to be and you know what will our interaction be like with a, a greater awareness. What research do I need to go back and look at that I'm interested in or that will help me you know in, in a little bit of a shift and I, I felt like there was a big shift 
that happened that day with that soup that we created together. How powerful it is when people can gather like that with the same common interest and just from an idea then shift into some practical action. Really, it comes down to that self-accountability and self-responsibility. And that's what I learnt a lot about for myself in this experience was all of the things that I can take responsibility for in my life big and simple choices to make that is this good for country you know or should I choose this other thing that is equally as good but it also has a benefit for country you know really walking that caring for country this was the most powerful way to share what my people have been talking about for a long time caring for country when you have healthy country you have healthy people And by not always putting ourselves first, you know, human economy and human industry and everything, we're not receiving the full benefits of that, of those industries and the the side effects that happen from that. And we see them in our health and well-being as a community. So how do we start bringing back these ways without people thinking, oh, that's primitive or we're going back to those old ways. You know, we've progressed so far now and we've got technologies. Well, technology has been really great in some advancements and in others, I feel like it's weakened us as a species. I can't even remember one phone number these days and I sometimes can't remember ways to places because I use the GPS you know little things like this they're great advances but what are they actually doing for our health if we've got machines out there digging all of the holes for the plants what's happened to my connection with my digging stick digging that hole and and my relationship with that plant that I'm putting in the ground that's building my connection with country and my awareness of the soil and the seasons on another level and it's good for my health and well-being you know I, I feel like we've kind of gone so far with some things and we need to bring them back and and use technology in a different way so that's what I felt like some of these discussions were about let's revisit those harvest and celebration ceremonies that bring our communities together. And like Stone Soup, it bring about that network of trust and solidarity, especially in times like these, as you were saying, Sam, COVID has really made such a big distance between people and we're losing that sense of community. And as humans, we need to feel that we belong somewhere that is massive in our health and well-being. And by having these seasonal ceremonies celebrating the the fruits of our country together, you know, I, I think we're all in, in agreement. and this was our common vision, our common goal for this project, Jakich La. Food, fire, ceremony, these are the things that we gather for and that bring people together. That's not just a Jara thing. So, yeah, I really hope that we can all, from this event, come together more in in a way that is serving the greater good, the greater community and and our country. I'd also like to acknowledge how resilient this country is to have undergone so many changes, radical changes, and to still be so beautiful today and continue producing food, beautiful experiences for people and being patient with us on this journey to return to country and and now navigate a new way into our future that is caring for country together. One year after the event, I caught up with Jodie Newcomb and asked her for an update of what's been happening around this project since last year when it all happened and if it's developed or changed or what might be next. This is Jodie. After the event, we were on a high because it really exceeded all of our expectations and had such a feel-good period afterwards. And then we thought we'd go for Creative Victoria funding, so we put in a massive grant for like $240,000 through the Creative Venture Program, and that was the range of money that they were they were offering. So much energy went into that, and so when we were sort of waiting around, and I think they delayed the decision because of COVID, we didn't really hear till January, and the city of Greater Bendigo had put in some co-funding, just a small amount, like 10000 and we'd got, you know, all the letters support, etc. And then in January, we found 
found out we didn't get it. And it was one of those one of those things where you're really just putting everything in your life on hold and we sort of lost a bit of faith, to be honest, and, and we had to just get on and organise other work. So in a way, when, you know, when February rolled around, we were all kind of fully booked, <laughs> except um, I had some capacity and, and I was really keen to continue and, and do something. So we had this massive proposal to draw from and we went back to the city of Greater Bendigo and said, look, you know, with the 10 grand, do you still have it available? Because we could do this, that and the other. And they were really keen. So we devised Eating Jara Country Healthy, which which is quite a modest and, and kind of organic evolution of where the last event left off, which we decided was actually a really healthy way to go. You know, sometimes when you drop too much ambition into something, it can it can be overwhelming and and sometimes you just need to move at a slower pace. So we all got together, Beck and Alex, uh, Charlie and Will and I, Sam was is now working at council full time, so he didn't really have capacity. But the four of us got together and um, we had a, a chat at Bar Midland. We started to explore what what this project was. And it was, I mean, spending time with Beck is always amazing and enriching. And I find the same when I spend time with Kath Coff. You, you just get so much wisdom through their way of seeing the world. And, and she explained this, this sort of philosophy of you do what, you sort of, you know, like you give your gifts and you do what feels right and then the land will let you know if you're on the right path and that will give you the assistance and the world will come to you if you're doing the right thing. So we, we took that gradual approach because we were going to go for more funding from Regional Arts Victoria and it was like, that's actually taking energy and effort away from what's here right now on the table, on the plate, so to speak. And she actually told this beautiful story about how she was doing a performance, one of her early performances as a, an artist, and her elder had told her, you need to get the branches of the highest tree to do the smoking ceremony probably or something at the beginning. And she looked out and the highest tree was like, the highest branch was like 10 or 15 metres high and there was no way they were going to reach it. And so she looked at the next tree and it was like these scraggly little leaves and her and her colleague at the time were trying to pull those leaves down and it just didn't feel right. And then all of a sudden there was this almighty crack and the branch from the big tree just fell off onto the ground. <laughs> and wow. it was like, wow. <laughs> so with that in mind, that actually really shaped the way I thought about work from mm. from the next few weeks after that. And so we did just take a gradual approach. And so we thought we'd take this kind of conversational style where we, we took the, the principles of what we developed, which were having conversations with farmers and looking at the land that they're working on and what's actually there and bringing the wisdom that Beck has as being a Jara person and a cultural ambassador and really examining the food system and how... We do eat Jara Country healthy. Why is it that we don't have the ability in Victoria to eat brew? Why is it that we don't have access to rabbit that's of an abundance because of these, you know, abattoir laws? And and so we're now we're now evolving those conversations and we're gonna be making a menu called the fifty year menu for eating Jara Country Healthy. Alex Perry's gonna design that menu. He's already well on the track because he's got some wonderful offerings there at Bar Midland. And we are hosting a conversation on Monday with uh, someone in the honey industry, someone in the, a few people in the abattoir industry around uh, different forms of mobile slaughter and things like that. And we're looking at native grains and that sort of thing and hope to release this menu along with a blog post for each dish. So we'll be thinking about what the next 50 years might look like in the evolution of that food source and you know thinking about what Jara people's role is in stewarding those resources as well which is a really interesting and new conversation for some in the industry so I'm really looking forward to that and sharing that to, and to sharing that with everybody and that will just sort of be gradually released but we also send out an email to everyone reminding them of their intention to country and asking for stories back and wanting to share those stories with everyone too. Just, well, not even just about their intention, but what have they been doing? What have they been eating? How have they been experiencing the, all of these questions and living with these questions over the last years? We've offered a supper club, so maybe that's the thing, like invite people to come and experience the menu over the next year at the Bar Midland. And yeah. So what, what does a, what's a supper club do? Supper Club would be sort of focused on conversation and a curated conversation where the food speaks to those questions and that and that content and that the people around the table are that have the intention of moving that conversation forward. So people would sort of opt in and I guess you'd also spend some money to be there because there's food supplied, it's a dinner. You'd opt in knowing that you were part of the conversation and that you would go regularly 
to like monthly dinners or something. Is that yeah, right? look, ideally what, what a supper club might look like is, is it would cost probably a bit more than the normal dinner because what you would see out of that would be the curation of that conversation and ideally some reporting back. You know, it could be something like a, a podcast that's aligned <laughs> with those those conversations yeah. that has public good, you know, so that the people around that um, table um, are evolving the sector wide and the systems wide conversations in a way that can be shared and that can be generative. And that, you know, by sharing really exquisite food in a, in a beautiful place with, with people you might not know already, you can kind of, yeah, be rewarded to, to make some interesting changes possible. So there you go. That was our second episode about Jackich La, eating country healthy. Again, the six people you heard in this episode in the main interviews were Jody Newcomb, Sam Thomas, Will Tate, Rebecca Phillips, Charlie Ahrens and Anna Knight. The soundscape used throughout this episode was by Mitch Boney and that was the sound used in the event. And also Alex Perry from Situate Dining and Ira Barker from Murnong Mummers need to be acknowledged as they were the, the food creators for the event, which was such a pivotal and important part of the event. There are links to many of the things discussed in the show in the show notes for the podcast and at saltgrasspodcast.com. For those of you listening on Main FM or 3MDR, please note that you can listen to all episodes, including the first episode in this two-part series on your preferred podcasting app or at saltgrasspodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials and and you can subscribe to our email list to get reminders and updates about the show. This program was made possible with support from Main FM and the Community Broadcasting Foundation. Find out more at cbf.org.au. My name is Ali Hanley. Thanks for listening. Salt, 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 Salt of the earth people. Grassroots change. Salt grass. Listen to all episodes of Salt Grass on your podcast app or at saltgrasspodcast.com.